By the grace of Almighty God are all things made possible on earth. Let us awaken our spirits with a song of invocation. Please rise. Maitri bhajata akilakhra jetri Maitri bhajata akilakhra jetri Maitri bhajata akilakhra jetri Atma Vaya Deva Parana Pipa Shata Atma Vaya Deva Parana Pipa Shata Yudham Tyajata Spardham Tyajata Yudham Tyajata Spardham Tyajata Tyajata Pareshva Krama Makramanam Tyajata Pareshva Krama Makramanam Maitrim Bhajata Akila Khrajetrim Janani Prithvi Kama Doga Ste Janani Prithvi Kama Doga Ste Janako Devaha Sakala Dayadu Janako Devaha Sakala Dayadu Dhamyata Dhata Dayatvam Janata Dhamyata Dhata Dayatvam Janata Shreyo Bhuyat Sakala Jananam 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 Um, I now invite our beloved Dean of Planning and Development, Dr. S. Vaidya Subramanian, to give the welcome address and set the tone for today's proceedings. Sir? Mr. Justice Nagamuthu, Judge of the High Court of Madras, Mr. Mohan Prasaran, Solicitor General of India, Mr. S. Gurumurthy, special invitees, faculty colleagues, student friends and friends from the print and electronic media. A very good morning to all of you. I'm again back here to address the same gathering. And I'm extremely happy today for a variety of reasons. More importantly, for two reasons. First, we are going to see the honoring of three outstanding jurists that the country produced, who left behind them permanent footprints that's worth emulating as students of law, as professionals, as well as somebody like me as a litigant. And secondly, we are also going to celebrate the germination of an idea that got seeded three months back when we decided to establish an initiative to understand the nuances of legal anthropology. And to do both of that, we have with us this morning 
Mr. Mohan Parasaran, the Solicitor General of India, Mr. S. Gurumurthy, whose acumen in corporate law is generally solicited by all corporates all over the country, and a very unassuming guest in the form of Mr. Justice Nagamuthu. I'm very happy, sir, that you are part of this morning's uh, function. Testimony to the fact that, and this is a real testimony to the fact that good initiatives will definitely have guests of his lordship's type to attend the same. I'll just start, I will set the context for this morning's event. Mr. Mohan Parasaran, in addition to launching the research chair on legal anthropology, will also be launching three schemes named after three illustrious legends of the Indian Bar, Justice Patanjali Shastri Memorial Scholarship Scheme, Nani Palkiwala Memorial Scholarship Scheme, as well as the G. Ramaswamy Memorial Scholarship Scheme. And it is so apt that these schemes named after such great individuals is also being inaugurated by an individual who belongs to an outstanding family that has also contributed some of the best jurists to our country. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about the family of the great Parasarans, whose contribution to the Indian legal landscape has been phenomenal and still continuing. And we have had the good fortune of knowing Sri Parasaran right from 1989. I think this is the Silver Jubilee year probably that we will be celebrating our association with your father. In some form or the other, right from the day he came here to deliver the convocation address till probably two days back when he spoke to our Vice Chancellor to convey his blessings on a different context. There has been one way or the other, there has been some form of relationship with the family of Mr. Parasarans, the senior Parasaran appearing for us. And also, we've been beneficiaries of the personal benevolence that he showered on our family. And continuing that, Mr. Mohan Parasaran himself was also appeared for Shastra as a council, who hosted some of our students when we visited, they visited the Supreme Court very recently. And his other son, Mr. Satish Parasanan, who's again been very generous to take some of our students as interns. And talking about that, I'll also come back to you, sir, requesting to accommodate some of our st students as interns in the office of the Solicitor General. And his gra Mr. K. Parasanan's grandson, Rahul, also now engaging with us in various moot court competition initiatives. This is just to demonstrate that the School of Law has a special relationship with the family of Mr. Parasaran. With this context, ladies and gentlemen, I take great pleasure in welcoming Mr. Mohan Parasaran on behalf of the entire Shastra University family. And the other outstanding public intellectual who's going to be a part of this gathering, Mr. S. Gurumurthy, he needs no introduction for this gathering because we are still not fully recovered from the hangover that we had when you delivered the lecture on evolution of law and society a couple of months back. You seeded the idea of the need for a study on legal anthropology. And it was after listening to that speech that we also decided that we need to develop a school of thought in the school of law here at Shastra University that encourages students and researchers, not only from the school of law, but from various other law schools, to engage into this complex subject of legal anthropology. And we owe it to Mr. Gurumurthy for having seeded this idea. And today, we see the birth of the formation of the research chair on legal anthropology. Thank you very much, sir, for providing us that insightful idea to start this. And I welcome you again.
on behalf of the entire Shastra University family. Two of these outstanding individuals are here to talk on two different topics that I have requested them to. Mr. Mohan Parasaran on what it needs to be a successful jurist coming from a family of successful jurists and to share his experiences of moving with people of great experience in the bar. And I am looking forward to your speech, sir, because it is only speeches of this type which will prove to be inspirational for students like you to become a very good judge in the future, laying the law for the land, or good lawyers with tactful, tactful interpretation skills fighting for a public cause, just as Mr. Nani Palkiwala did, and also learn the art of court craft with great amount of wit and humor, just as Mr. G. Ram Swami did. Now, each of these three individuals that we have chosen have left behind, as I said before, footprints that are characteristically theirs. And you will know what it needs to become a successful jurist from the horse's mouth. And secondly, on why we need to study legal anthropology. I am not qualified to talk on the topic. I would rather sit down and listen as to why we need to study this issue of legal anthropology. But thought I will just leave with a small idea parked in the mind of this audience. Today, in the name of progressive jurisprudence, private disputes often end up in the form of an order that mandates the way in which society needs to behave. Should private disputes actually be the tool for mandating social behavior? Should law actually dictate how a society should behave? Or is it the social conduct, the right social conduct should be a model for which the, the jurisprudence need to choose those right social conduct as benchmark? Now, this is a big debate that is ongoing. And it is not just the relationship between law and society. The study on legal anthropology is something more than that. Sociology, law, economics, culture, politics, something beyond just the simple nuggets that we think is legal anthropology. So I thought I will set this as the context. And I'm eagerly looking forward, just as you are, to listen from these two outstanding individuals. And I take this opportunity again to welcome all of you for this morning's function. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I now invite our beloved Vice Chancellor to uh, uh, present our guests of honor with uh, tokens of our appreciation. Sir? Inspector Sri Gurmurthy, sir, our research mentor. Honorable Justice Nagamutu. I now invite our esteemed guests of honor uh, on the dais to inaugurate and launch the research chair and announce the scholarship schemes by lighting the lamp.
Thank you very much, sirs. The three schemes that we have announced, uh, Justice Patanjali Shastri Scholarship Scheme, the Nani Palkiwala Memorial Scholarship Scheme, and uh, the G. Ramaswamy Memorial Scholarship Scheme. Each of this will identify the best outgoing student uh, from the degree programs of BA LLB, BCom LLB, and VBA LLB every year. And each student will be awarded a citation and a cash prize of rupees 1 lakh. And the proud recipient uh, will also carry home the legacy of these jurors. The research chair on anthropology today, the launch is not, it, the, the launch by lighting the Kuttubalaka is symbolic. The tangible output is the management has decided to contribute 50 lakhs to create a corpus for this research chair on legal anthropology. With the corpus, we will conduct research, offer internship to students, as well as conduct periodic workshops, seminars to study and understand this emerging co confluence between law and society. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I now uh, request most respected Shri Mohan Purasaran, Solicitor General of India, to give us the inaugural address on being a successful jurist. My dear and esteemed friend and uh, the mentor of this great institution, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Setraman, respected and esteemed Sri Gurumurthi Ji, Dr. Vaidya Subramaniam, Honorable Mr. Justice Nagamuttu, the Dean of the Law Faculty, other distinguished members of the faculty, and above all, my dear students and friends. I think the Sastra University has put me in a very great predicament to let out a trade secret. But nevertheless, I think it's a very great occasion to be present in this great institution, which has grown over the years only due to sheer dedication and involvement of uh, Sri Setraman and his family <laughs> and they have actually worked only for promoting education unlike several other institutions and also at the same time they have worked for communal causes and philanthropy, as we have recently seen. And I am very proud of uh, their activities. In fact, our association with uh, Mr. Sitraman's family spans over well over, I think, two and a half decades. And we are very happy that their family has been growing by the grace of the Almighty year after year. Likewise, we have also had very great personal regard for Sri Gurumurthi Ji. He is a great all-rounder, not only in, he's a, he's a great expert in accountancy and also he is advisor on many intricate subjects involving law, 
to several actually top class industrialists in the country and has have saved i think many i think industrialists at very critical points of time and i have been witness to that now coming to today's topic that is actually being a successful jurist we have just inaugurated scholarships in the name of three brilliant jurists which india has produced the first one chief justice patanjali shastri who was the first chief justice from tamil nadu i would say unified tamil nadu because now there is a controversy regarding this and sri justice patanjali shastri had belonged to a very i think uh, humble family his father was a sanskrit professor and uh, he had a fair amount of practice before the madras high court but uh, showed his metal on the bench initially as a judge of the madras high court then after the elevation to the supreme court in the year 1947 then supreme court then of course supreme court was formally inaugurated in the year 1950 and uh, he became the chief justice of india in the year 1952 and was there for about 2 years and 2 months and retired in 1954 and uh, at the time the constitution was actually in the making and he was party to some of the very important pronouncements such as the first ak gopalan's case which uh, sought to interpret article 21 and uh, later on some other cases including the first educational matter where whether reservations could be made for backward classes champakam dorraj which went from madras of course i'm going to deal with their qualities and the subject is how to be a successful jurist in fact in today's context i think uh, it is very difficult to define the expression jurist itself i think mr gurumurthy will agree because law has changed so much jurist from a traditional point of view was something different actually you can easily actually name several jurists like shri nani palkiwala or shri sirvai or from tamil nadu if you just say like shri vk tiruvengadachari vk t so they are all great constitutional experts but today are we getting those sort of people law has changed no there has been a great evolution and now the entire phase has changed the sense that you get cases in several new branches and today in the indian supreme court is faced with uh, mainly pils public interest litigations or the supreme court hears mainly cases concerning the common man no? or parties in person the supreme court originally was actually intended to hear only important constitutional cases and was never intended to be the usual regular appellate court the high court was 
to be the final court in most matters and matters like matrimonial cases, rent control matters or cases involving property disputes unless they involve very, very substantial questions of law were never intended to be taken up to Supreme Court. But if you now come and watch the Supreme Court today, you only find either matrimonial cases or Section 138 Negotiable Instruments Act or narcotics or offenses against women, criminal cases. Chief Justice's court is now hearing criminal appeals. I think uh, those days, I think they were sitting in a combination of three hearing important constitutional matters. But these are my preliminary observations. Now actually there has been a complete change in the very pattern of litigation in the Supreme Court. And only in a few courts I find they hear actually matters of complexity on a final hearing day. And that too I find that so-called bracketed top class lawyers, they are absent. And they only come for admissions on Mondays and Fridays. And we find actually in horses, you actually classify horses as class 1, class 2, or class 3, class 4. You find class 4 horses arguing very important matters. That's why actually law goes in a different direction. Therefore, I think we'll have to give a serious thinking with regard to these aspects and I think reorient. You know, I asked the some of the judges, in fact, the former Chief Justice and also the present Chief Justice of India as to the need for reorienting the entire functioning of the Supreme Court. Now the present Chief Justice of India has decided to constitute a regular constitution bench of five judges on a regular basis. That's why now I think this Mullai Periyar is being heard now by a particular constitution bench. Then from next month onwards, it will be a different combination. And once I think the Supreme Court starts taking up matters of importance, I think things will change. We actually, the court can of course hear matters involving public interests or matters which are intended for electronic media, but they should also hear cases which have been pending for years involving very great questions of law. And they should continue to lay down the law which we badly actually require for posterity. If you actually see the reports from 1950 till 19, I think 70, we have had excellent quality judgments, even up to 1980 also. From 1980 to 90, the pattern changed towards PIL. Post 1990s, you got all sorts of judgments. Then later on, it was all, now we see, as I said, judgments in all branches, two pages, three pages, and sometimes only repeating arguments of counsel. They start by saying that these are the facts from the pleadings, so-and-so contended, so-and-so contended, respondent contended, so-and-so cited, in this case it was held, in that case it was held. And last paragraph, conclusion. So that's been like that. <coughs> now, let me come to the main subject, how to become a successful jurist. See, what I personally feel is, to become a successful jurist, essentially, I think you have to basically put in, you will have to have that bent of mind first, right from day one, 
from your childhood you must develop an attitude of uh, being academically oriented and one must have a analytical mind and try to develop knowledge in not only law but all branches and also you must be quite strong in english and english literature apart from some other language like sanskrit or maybe some other foreign language and i personally feel i think most of these jurists who have actually been successful in the past i think it's sheer dedication and hard work integrity and honesty now if we take the case of uh, see nani palkiwala and sri g ramaswami both cases are extremely interesting because if one is the north pole the other is the south pole sri nani palkiwala was uh, born with a very humble simple parsi family and uh, he had not come from any background on that since that his father was not a lawyer and uh, he worked in the chambers of sir jamshed ji kanga and uh, mainly concentrated on taxation as i said he was right from his i think anger days he did lot of research and he was so actually knowledgeable in english literature if you could read any of his books also see the flair of his language and uh, he wrote that fantastic book kanga and palki wala income tax act and those days the sampat ayengar who actually sought to question the book written by palki wala on the ground that it infringed his copyright and the suit was filed for restraining the publication of uh, the first edition of palkiwala's book income tax act before the madras high court and uh, the case came up before none other than another great giant justice balakrishna iyer and uh, justice balakrishna iyer ultimately paid great compliment to this jurist palkiwala and he said what nonsense income tax act only merely contains sections it is not actually the brain child of uh, sampadayanga and mr palkiwala has only sought to explain the sections he has not copied verbatim it he has given on interpretation he has given on interpretation i salute this youngster and uh, later on you know how all nan palkiwala's book were sold like hot cakes and sampadayangar was running into several volumes nani's first edition was only one volume and later on it was two volumes it used to be so crisp and uh, palkiwala of course never wanted any more editions after his death also like uh, sirwai because he knew others will spoil the show and uh, he rose to fame in the supreme court i think uh, in the 60s 1960s i have seen sri palkiwala personally in action in the supreme court and uh, i came into acquaintance 
mainly because of uh, the great sage Kanchi Paramacharya, because I owe my success mainly to Kanchi Paramacharya, because I had interacted with the great sage even when I was actually doing my BA degree when the sage was camping in Maharashtra in Melgaon and I had the good fortune to stay with him for several days and we used to walk in the villages in Maharashtra that I think was in 1980-81 or 1780-81 when Sri N.T. Ramarao actually brought uh, an ordinance to abolish the hereditary archakatwa in Andhra Pradesh, Zarchakas. Then there was a great gentleman who was with Paramacharya. His name was uh, strangely Anadura Ayanga. And uh, Anadura Ayanga actually called me. He said, Paramacharya wants to see you. And then I had gone there along with some other people who were living in Tirupati. Then he said, of course, even though senior Parasara is appearing, better you also discuss with uh, Mr. Palkiwala. I have already sent word to him. He doesn't speak on the phone, only, unlike present-day sannyasins. So I have already spoken. Another Ayengar has already met him. You go to Bombay. These are some of the points which I feel. See, he, he had read, uh, Parmachara had read that case desired by the Supreme Court, which arose from Tamil Nadu in the year 1973, upside down. And he said that the ordinance passed by the Andhra Pradesh government was clearly in the teeth of 1973 Supreme Court, which Nani argued. And uh, you go and meet him. Then I had, I had good fortune. And Mr. Palkiwala, to his credit room, I went to his flat in Back Bay Reclamation. He's a Parsi, but was so thorough with the religious practices in our temples because by the time he had read and he knew what was a Vaikana Sahagama, what was a Saiva Agama, different types of Agamas, which was actually regularly practiced in temple. He had also read a book about the Tirupati temple. See, that is why I said, these are the traits of a jurist. And he immediately, I think, see, they were so simple, jurists were so simple, and uh, I found he was alone in the office, except his lady secretary was there. These days, if you go to all these five-star lawyers, I think the amount of show, you have about 20 ju juniors around them, but Nani was sitting alone. He called a stenographer. He himself walked to, his, to the shelf, picked up the book, and started dictating. And he dictated for about, say, 50 minutes. Remarkable ability. And that was a great learning experience. And after that, I think I moved with him fairly closely. In fact, <coughs> he used to come to Madras off and on to visit Shankar Netralaya for the eye treatment. On a few occasions, I had the good fortune to go and receive him at the airport. And I also saw him actively arguing some of the cases in the Supreme Court, including the Federation of Hotels, Luxury Tax, Levy of Expenditure Tax, I'm sorry. And uh, also challenging the amendment made to Section 
80 retrospective amendment to section 80J as well as 80M of the Income Tax Act. Even though later years he was not that successful in the Supreme Court, but he argued cases with such a great precision and uh, see he had a concept in his mind and he had no confusion in his mind and uh, in spite of I think later years he had some nervous debility but in spite of it his delivery was fantastic and he was again a great man who could never tolerate corruption and a great person with integrity and boldness. He advised, he was never bothered no, even about Indira Gandhi at the peak of power and emergency. He gave the right advice, he appeared for Mrs. Gandhi and whatever is right he will tell, whoever high the party might be. That was Nani Palkiwala and uh, that's why these people are remembered even today, everywhere. And I am very happy that Shastra has honored Nani Palkiwala by starting a scholarship in his memory. And also rightfully also started a scholarship in the name of the first Chief Justice from Tamil Nadu, Sri Patanjali Shastri. Now coming to G. Ramaswamy, I said, of course, I have, of course, personal, great personal regard for G.R. as well. He was also, in one sense, my guru. And uh, I have, in fact, he had, he had so much of confidence in me, he entrusted several matters. Even though his brother G. Rajagopal was also practicing in Madras, G. S. G. Subramanian was also practicing in Madras. He had entrusted some of his matters to me. But G. R. was of a different metal because you see, you got five, all of us have five fingers. Likewise, Juris, Ram Jatmanani is a jurist. But Ram Jatmanani, everyone knows. He is eccentric. I can't actually tell more. But he is he's one of the greatest of jurists. Nobody can match Ram Jatmanani on his knowledge of Evidence Act, criminal law, and he can put anybody at his bay in his, in his peak days. You know? Still, you can, people can't forget the ten questions he used to put to Rajiv Gandhi. Likewise, GR was, I think, uh, a combination of uh, Ram Jatmalani and uh, had a brilliant mind, in fact. He started, his, his father was one of the greatest of lawyers, the Mufasal, not far away from here. Ganapati Agraharam and his name was Ganesayar. There was a very big family and he also had a very roaring practice here and he shifted to Chennai in the late 60s as a government advocate and see he just shifted in the late 1960s and from there he started to build up his practice I think tremendously, I think on all sides. He was closely associated with uh, the late Mohan Kumar Mangalam and uh, he developed wonderful practice on the constitutional side and uh, was appointed by the then DMK government as the government leader. And uh, most of the, you name any top industrialist in Tamil Nadu, he was appearing for them. And I came into contact with him in the year 1986 when we went for 
the International Law Association Conference to Seoul. And he was suddenly asked to speak in the conference by the then Chief Justice Bhagwati because uh, Mr. Venugopal, who was to come, he had not arrived. And the international conferences, he must always actually be prepared and give a proper speech. And it contained a very packed audience of jurists. But GR stole the show, but with humor, no? even in that conference. So, and uh, GR became the additional solicitor general in 1987 and uh, later on became the attorney general for India. But he taught me a very important thing. We were actually preparing a suit and uh, the Bombay people I don't want to name the lawyer. They had actually brought a plaint running into about uh, 52 pages to GR. So he was sitting in his office. He was not having patience because he had so many clients waiting. He said, what have they done, I say? This is not a red petition. If you actually file the suit, we'll be finished. And I have just gone through it for about 15 minutes. In 15 minutes, I have found 40 contradictions. Therefore, we'll have to completely change it. You start doing the work. Then I started doing it. Then I started somehow redoing everything. But he said, don't do all this. You must actually examine each and every document exchanged and also discuss with the concerned parties and form an idea in your mind. You must draw a bigger circle. Then you must actually think what would be the points that will be raised by the other side. What are all the points, defenses, which can be raised by the other side? You must try to actually cover up everything in this itself and avoid inconvenient things and also try to see what questions which can be put to witnesses and try to also include all that and if a particular question is put what sort of an answer should be given that should also be somehow contained what are the legal position of course plain you should not actually talk law at all you must so drafted that it does not go contrary to law. And with all this, he had to reduce the plaint to not exceeding 10 pages. And with great difficulty, I tried to do that. And he still sat and reduced it to 7 pages. And ultimately, I think he proved right. And when the suit was decreed, he was not alive. The suit came for hearing in 2001 and the suit was decreed by a knowledgeable judge, you know, Justice Prabhasi Deva, after a heavy contest and uh, it's all kudos to GR. Such a brilliant mind and I learned from him the art, you know, the art of also examining and cross-examining witnesses. He was also a great trial lawyer and a person who is known for great uh, humor and court. He will carry you know, any, any court he will carry with his humor. And he used to joke, he, used to, he said, I was such a lawyer, you know, I was such a fool, I never knew that I will become the Attorney General of India. My father just uh, gave me the first brief and just told me to go and ask for time. I literally went and appeared before the judge and the case was called out. Then I said, Your Honor, what is the time? 
So my practice started like that. But anyhow, I think by the grace of Almighty, I think I have grown and had a good innings. Unfortunately, he died prematurely. And uh, he could have lived for some more years. And it is befitting. In fact, GRS represented Shastra also. Initially, he started, he, I think, got the first order for Shastra. And Shastra became one of the greatest of litigants, thanks to GR. And uh, it is befitting that Shastra has thought about all these three. And uh, it is our idea. In fact, uh, congratulate uh, Shastra for remembering all these three people. Their memories should always be remembered and they should be celebrated forever. I thank uh, Shastra and the team and all of you for having given me an opportunity and having listened to me patiently. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You've not just shared the trade secrets, but I think you have filled the audience with a sense of wonder with your recounting of personal experiences with these great personalities. Thank you for that, sir. Uh, I now invite our respected Sri Gurumurthy, our research mentor, chair mentor, to give us a special address on the need to study legal anthropology. Professor Setu Raman, Vice Chancellor of this institution, and a person who has a knack of connecting me to this institution almost on every irrelevant and conceivable occasion. And this is the first time I am sharing platform with him. He has always been used to sitting on the, among the audience. But I asked him, how is it that you are on the stage? He said that we have put a television from which I can see you speaking. Otherwise, I feel better listen from the audience. So the secret of his being on the stage is the technological uh, addition that has been made. Then uh, Justice Nagamuttu, whose presence is a very accidental surprise and a matter of happiness for me. And Mr. Mohan Parasharan, a good friend of mine, he made speaking so, look so easy a conversational, as if he was talking to each one of you personally. That's an art which most lawyers have not learnt. And he has a very special way of uh, talking and nothing great, but he made every one of us feel at home with his delivery. And Mr. Vaidya Subramaniam, my friend, and Ravi Shekhar Raju, the head of the department of the School of Law. See, my Adventure into law was a matter of accident. In fact, many things in my life has been accident. I became a journalist by accident, chartered accountant by accident, and my entry into law was also a matter of accident. I thought I would say a few words about these great people, the jurists whose names have figured in the awards today. You know, we are talking about legal anthropology. Justice Patanth, Patanjali Shastri interpreted Article 30 of the Constitution. He was in a minority. He said Article 30 does not stand independent of Article 29. And if minorities have rights, those rights have to be linked to their cultural rights and it cannot be in the secular domain, which is one of the finest interpretation of the Constitution. And the Supreme Court disagreed with him. Till today, the Supreme Court is finding it difficult to come out of what it had said and join Patanjali Shastri because Patanjali Shastri interpreted Article 30 on the base of anthropological evidence of Article 29. What was the purpose of Article 29? 
and article 30 cannot be divorced from that purpose this is the anthropological interpretation supreme court constituted a 11 judge bench to reconsider the minority rights decisions which it had given afterwards they had to dissolve that bench till today the law on minority rights is so confusing so conflicting and so disturbing the nation itself the supreme court itself does not know how to come out of it if only they had adopted the dictum of Patanjali Shastri, the confusion would never have been there. And next, I want to share something personal about Mr. Nani Palkiwala. There was a chartered accountant who had a hugely com complicated and challenging case to handle. I was just 27 at that time. So when in a group discussion, I divert from the opinion given by Mr. Palkiwala. All were my seniors who were sitting and discussing this. And they said, if you are differing from Nani Palkiwala, who is to go and tell Mr. Nani Palkiwala that he should reconsider his opinion? Then Mr. Ramnath Goenka, who was the person who shaped my strategic mind, he told me of all the people, he is the youngest. So I choose Gurumurti to go and talk to Nani Palkiwala. Because even if Palkiwala humiliates him, he is a young boy. If he accepts him, then it is something great. So Ramnath Goenka telephoned to Nani Palkiwala, don't be uh, deceived by the man's appearance. I used to look a school boy at that time. So he said, don't be deceived. Nani, he is a Vamana Vathara. He may have something to tell you. Please listen to him carefully. So when I went there, I said, I don't know how to open my mouth, I am shivering. But I think your opinion needs reconsideration. This is it. It's a very technical point, I don't want to get into it. I, I interpreted the income tax law through the constitutional principles. He looked at it and said, I am wrong. I was shocked. What a magnanimous mind. He was a towering person at that time. He could well have said, I throw you out of the room. Who are you? I was nobody. He said, you are wrong. I, I'm wrong. But I want to know, how did you connect the two? Sir, I had no other way of interpreting it in favor of my client within the four corners of the income tax law. That proved to be an escalator for me. The confidence level, the recognition I got out of the whole thing is something, of course, these are all accidents in life, great accidents which God gives once in a time. And I can't still, they, after, afterwards I had many occasions I had moved with him. The man had the lost preference for money. I don't think he ever thought of money. There were more cases he had argued without fees than cases in which he has taken fees. I think more cases he has donated to the trust it is because he saw the profession of lawyers not just an intelligent man's profession but also an intellectual's profession. An intellectual is proud of his intelligence. A mere intelligent person is only egoistic about his intelligence. There is a difference between pride and ego. In people like Nani, we saw pride. Pride of not just the knowledge, but as the responsibility, the wisdom, the duties he owed it to the society, to the bar, to the bench, to the nation. You see, these are all qualities which are disappearing because the tsunami of money has taken over the society. It has affected every profession and it has affected the legal profession also. Then, one thing I must say about my interaction with G. Ramaswamy. You know, there was a law passed by the government in Tamil Nadu banning hoardings being put. And they passed the law under Article 31C of the Constitution, which said that if a law is passed to implement Article 39C and D, that means if it is passed to prevent monopolies and things like that, then that law cannot be challenged. The question is whether the declaration attached to that law was proper. 
so when i told him that uh, there is a principle called pitan substance in pitan substance this declaration doesn't hold good he said who are you are you a lawyer you are talking about the constitution of india i said sir this is one law about which every citizen can talk he said i expected it from you that's why i asked this question so gr is never defeated in everything he always used to win there was a thakkar natarajan commission which was the most indefensible commission the government of india set up that was when i was arrested uh, when i was pursuing uh, corruption and uh, trying to find out how much money is there in swiss bank i was arrested by the cb on a forged letter and a commission of inquiry was set up and in the commission of inquiry i demanded the uh, that uh, that uh, forged letter must be produced jatmalani was my counsel the way jatmalani was openly abusing the judges and it was g ramaswamy's responsibility to defend the judges you know how beautifully he defended just by one word we lords there is a slight spelling error in jatmalani's name it is not jatmalani he is jatmalani i mean he completely changed the discourse everybody laughed and afterwards ram jatmalani never abused the judges you know jatmalani as uh, uh, mohan said is a very mercurial counsel he can take on anybody because the amount of intellectual competence the man demonstrated made people fear respect him move away from him the show deference to him so jatmalani arguing is not an easy thing to argue against him is not easy to listen to his arguments is not easy this is how gr tackled him he is jet malaini and not jet malani so with this few transgressions i will try and encapsulate what is legal anthropology and what is the need to study it it's a huge subject it's not something which can be captured in an hours lecture and particularly in india this requires to be studied by a team of some 20 30 scholars for at least 5 6 years for us to get an alternative perspective about what law is for example you take what mohan mentioned agamas agama is is drawn from anthropological principles we do not know the concept of cultural rights in the constitution is drawn from anthropological anthropological principles religious rights drawn from anthropological principles the reservation for scheduled caste scheduled tribe drawn from anthropological principles the reservation for backward class drawn from anthropological principles we just don't know so anthropology is very intimately connected to the law as we understand it today deal with it today and somehow in the western discourse on law for the rest of the world they have completely destroyed the concept of anthropology anthropology is a subject which grew out of the interaction between the colonizers and the colonized people the colonizers came with the idea that they have to civilize the rest of the world the rest of the world are barbarians they are savages we have to civilize them this was the view it is the white man's burden to civilize all the uncivilized to brute people but there were some very intelligent people who came and found that there were great qualities in this society from which we may even have to learn for example when england went and dominated the whole world they found all the languages which they came across the colony colonized people's languages they were all very inferior languages to their language english but when they came to india they found a language which became the mother of their language sanskrit they didn't know how to handle it and so they said no 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 this is not your language this is actually our language you have stolen that language this is how anthropology of linguistics was perverted anthropology is a subject which goes to the root of a society a root of a civilization the root of sociology 
the continuity of a society's uh, self-image. Now, if you look at how anthropology is studied, it is a very huge subject. They study it like this. There is socio-cultural anthropology, biological anthropology. Many people do not know that in the entire Western Hemisphere, the total plant varieties are only 250. Uh, total grain varieties are only 250. But in India, the rice varieties themselves are 100,000, out of which 26,000 is alive even today. This is biological anthropology. The plant varieties in India are supposed to be over 80 lakhs. According to Brahma Sutra, Bhashya, in which Sankara writes about how human beings are superior among the 85 lakh organisms in the world. Everybody laughed at Shankaracharya. How did he get these 85 lakhs? You know, in the year 90, 2006, science today found that there were 58 lakh organisms. In 2011, the science magazine said it is 86 lakhs. Maybe after Shankaracharya's lifetime, another lakh has got added. So this is the understanding of anthropology, which is sourced in our literature. It is also sourced in everybody's literature. Some literatures are oral, some literatures are written. The model in which a society lives, then archaeological anthropology, that is where agamas come. Then linguistic anthropology, what is the origin of a language? How languages have changed in shape, in script, in grammar, in, in presentation? This is linguistic anthropology. Then in sociocultural anthropology, there are subdivisions. You call arts, music, dance. You know, there is no particular dance which has no source. For example, Kuchipudi dance, it has a particular source. Bharatanatyam, it has a particular source. And music, Hindustani music, Carnatic music, all this is sourced in a certain scientific development, evolution, innovation. All this is anthropological development. Then economic, political, and uh, developmental. This is one thing I would like to deal with today. Then kinship, feminism, gender issues. Now we are only looking at gender issues in the way the West used to look at gender issues. And there are many traditional societies in which women were tremendously respected. In the West, there was no tradition of respect for women. In fact, the women struggled throughout their life, for example, just for voting rights. In England, women got voting rights only in 1928. In America, women got voting rights only in 1924. And black women got voting rights in America only in 1945. And in Switzerland, women got voting rights only in 1962. It is because women were considered to be, according to their religious and cultural beliefs, less than human beings and more than animals. So women had to fight. But in many societies, women were respected. That is the anthropological tradition of women. But those legal principles, anthropological, legal, social, cultural practices have formed part of the legal domain of those societies. But unfortunately, we are now logging on to the Western way of understanding the gender relationship, which confuses us, which confuses our law, which confuses, creates conflict between the society and law, which creates conflict between politics and uh, judiciary. So, unless we understand that there is a particular way of life to which we are accustomed, and custom is a very important source of law that is accepted, common law source of customs, but the legislature has the right to amend it. They have the right to amend it based on a philosophy. The philosophy is past is wrong. Past is wrong, so have to, you have to amend. I will come to it. How? the past is wrong principle was applied for developmental economics and how tremendous hardship and chaos it has caused to the world that I will come to you 
by reference to the United Nations document, then medical, nutritional, psychological anthropology. You know, there are societies where there are special medical gifts, medicinal tradition, and there is one healing hand theory in Scandinavian countries. There are certain families who, if they touch, your bodily ailments are cured. Even today such families are there. You can't scientifically explain this, but it is there. There is a Varmakkalai, which is prevalent in Kerala and in Kanyakumari. There are people who had incurable bodily problems and the Varmakkalai man will come and touch the relevant points and you are cured. And you know about this um, acupressure, acupuncture, none of which finds in the modern scientific approach to medical treatment. But this is medical anthropology. Likewise, political and legal anthropology. What is the political, political institutions? What is the norms of politics? Do we look to the Westminster system? Or do we look to the American system, which is the latest? Or we go back to the Platonian system? Or do we go back to our Yudhishthira? Or other great lawgivers? And you have completely shut your eyes to our own legal system, our own constitutional understanding, and our own way of relating in the society, which is prevalent even today. And it is so wide. For example, the way the Beel tribe manages its civil law, the Indian civil law can never penetrate there. Because they organize their affairs in such a way, they don't go to courts. Unless you go to court, your law will not work. Their society manages things. And even today there are conflicts between the village panchayats and the, and, uh, the uh, judgment of high courts. In fact, I wrote an article castigating a judge who called village panchayat kangaroo courts. I said, don't look at the cinema and say the village panchayats are kangaroo courts. But for village panchayats, caste panchayats, religious people, the amount of dispute that will go to the courts in India will be thousand times more, maybe hundred thousand times more, the courts will run, run away. Most disputes are resolved by social intervention. There is a social authority. There is a cultural headmanship that resolves this dispute, but there is no... In fact, one person asked me, you are talking about legal anthropology, how will you integrate it into the modern law? I told them only one thing. You amend the civil procedure code that a person who approaches the court must file an affidavit that he has followed all the known traditional models of resolving disputes and the dispute has not been resolved. Give four instances that he approached the religious head, he approached his eldest person in the family, he approached so-and-so who is a very well-known jurist. I asked him to resolve these problems and he, they intervened, the other party did not listen and that is why I am coming to court. And if the affidavit is proved to be false, you dismiss the case. You integrate anthropology with modern law. But there is no original thinking as to how to do it. And so, legal and political anthropology is completely proscribed in India, banned in India. And we have delegitimized it, called it names. Because it is not handled by people with black robes. So you must understand the amount of loss, the amount of illegitimacy we are heaping on a society, which even today, 700,000 people, 700,000 villages in this country, 7 lakh villages, are living with only 12,800 police stations. It is not possible to manage India through police stations, or municipal courts, or district courts, or high courts. It requires an enormous social mechanism to be in place. That is legal anthropology. Then natural and scientific anthropology. The entire benefit of the anthropological heritage of India has been denied to us. This is the point I am going to make, how important it is for us to revive this study and why it failed. You know, legal anthropology, generally the principle of anthropology was born in India through John Mame. You must have heard about that name, man who wrote the Hindu law. He came as a, an officer of the uh, British 
and found there is a huge uh, corpus of law, uh, smritis, and people handle it in such a way that there is a social order. But he said there is a problem in this. This is a status-oriented, relationship-oriented legal system. And we are bringing in a social contract and contractual relation system, the contractual legal system. So contractual legal system versus a relation-based society, conflicts emerged. The society lives through a relationship. For example, I have resolved many family disputes. One of the difficult points in which the family disputes cannot be resolved is the younger brother sends a legal notice to the elder brother. Sir, you have legal notice on Chita, sir. It's a very legitimate thing in law. But the society doesn't accept it as legitimate. Appa said, you have legal notice on Chita, sir. And the first thing a lawyer advises is to send legal notice. A relation-based society, a culturally oriented society, a society which has higher principles to live than just to fight for money, will not accept it. There is a cultural milieu that goes with it. Actually, in 1986, there is a judgment of the Privy Council which said that you cannot decide legal disputes only on the basis of the modern law. You have got to go back to the cultural milieu. And that is why legal anthropology is being reinstated in the Western countries. In America, it is being reinstated. But in India, there is no consciousness about legal anthropology because to talk about the past is wrong. Because past is not in English, you know. It is in Tamil, it is in Sanskrit, it is in Telugu, it is in Malayalam. These are all very inferior languages. So you must understand, because we have discredited the past, we have not evaluated the past. We have not brought about a comparison between what is the past and now. I'll give you a small example. If you go to the courts, the first thing the lawyer tells the witness or the person who files the affidavit, no, don't tell the truth. Unnecessarily, if you tell the truth, you lose the case. You modify it like this. But in a village panchayat, which takes place in Mariamman temple, the man is asked to swear before God whether what he is saying is true or not. The man will never tell a lie. You consider it an inferior way of setting. You also, in the, in the court also, the Gita book is shown, Bible is shown, Quran is shown. But in the court, none of these books has any value. People openly lie on the touching the book. You know why? The courts have no value. It doesn't have social sanction. It has a legal sanction. It has a constitutional sanction. It has a formal value. It has no cultural value. So we have a legal system which is divorced from the cultural milieu of India. This is for jurists to find out how to align the two. So it started with Maine, who said, no, our legal system is based on contract, it is based on the state, it is based on equality. And this colonial, colonized people, they have a status based and there is no justice in this. And uh, so we have to throw it out. One Malinowski, he disputed it thoroughly. And he demonstrated, now all the legal pundits agree that Malinowski's principle he so aptly put. He said, your criminal law, your modern law only punishes the deviant. But anthropological, cultural, traditional law corrects the deviant. You have refused to factor in the need to correct the deviant. You want to send people to jail, but you don't want to prevent people from going to jail. So Malinowski's thinking, which has to be studied in the context of the Indian law, how crimes can be prevented, how deviance from normal behavior can be prevented. This has not been pursued. Nowhere in the world it is pursued because the colonized people accepted the colonizer's law, their jurisprudence, their system. And now there is, this system is unable to deliver. There is a problem associated with this. It is not delivering even in America. In America, legal system has become so costly People are afraid of going to a lawyer. 
you know in india at least there is a law which says the lawyer cannot sh share the spoils of the case with the client let us assume i am filing a suit for 1000 crores in india he can only ask for a fee in america you can say if you get 1000 crores i will fight for your case if you get 250 crores you must give me 100 crores this is perfectly valid in america so in america the normal people can never approach the court is finished it has become such a costly adventure but traditional law the anthropological and cultural law is open to everybody and how we can integrate the functioning of the traditional law with the modern law is the biggest challenge that we will be facing in the coming decade or so that's why i told dr vai subramanian and i told the vice chancellor what you are doing is something out of the way in 5 years this is going to be such a relevant study that it combines anthropology they say is the study of the external characteristics of men and sociology is the study of the internal characteristics of the society but social anthropology covers both so if a society's long life which has gone into the dna there is a family tradition there is a community tradition there are sampradayas there are religious forces all of them exert such powerful influence over the people they discipline people they make them accept certain rules voluntarily and if you don't recognize the legal effect of those behavioral patterns the behavioral law which prevents deviance from abnormal conduct and makes a man abnormal that is not factored into the current understanding about law and i will just deal with two aspects and say how the whole world has been distorted by ignoring a society's tradition and history i am going to read out something from the united nations document this is development of anthropology of modernity modernity and anthropology have nothing to do with each other in fact modernity denies anthropology modernity means disbelief in tradition in fact there is a particular reference that modern anthropology regards the fundamental of modern anthropology is religion is a magical thinking and every religion is a cultural product created by the human community that worships there is no sacredness in religion religion is your creation and so it has to be destroyed that is why the conflict between secular and sacred domains in the west there was the secularism in the west wants religion destroyed it has destroyed it you know why churches are being sold in england why temples are buying and housing hindu gods in churches because they have lost faith in religion because of this conflict which modernity created between religion and modernity now i will read out what the united nations document says if you have to develop economically what you should do there is a sense in which rapid economic progress is impossible without painful adjustment you please hear the next two sentences very carefully afterwards you can talk amongst yourself ancient philosophies have to be scrapped old social institutions have to disintegrate bonds of caste creed and race have to burst and large number of persons who cannot keep up with progress have to have their expectation of a comfortable life frustrated very few communities are willing to pay the full price for economic progress this this is united nations document 
This is United Nations Department of Social and Economic Affairs, measures of the economic development in underdeveloped societies. This document is dated 1951. You know this has been proved to be complete failure now. No society is willing to give up its culture or tradition or language or religion. And the entire approach was all this has to be discarded if you have to grow economically. All the economic policies of the West and the rest and including us is based on the fact that your tradition is going to be a stumbling block for your growth. This is economic anthropology. Modern economic anthropology which says unless you give up your traditions you can never grow. And an American anthropologist, Professor Shalins, he is probably one of the greatest anthropologists and see how he has put it amazingly. In a paper titled on the anthropology of modernity, Professor Shalins, a prominent American anthropology, anthropologist, captures the essence of the theory of modernity as homogenizing the world through economic development based on consumerism. This economic development means integrating the political thoughts, political institutions, economic institutions, social institutions, ultimately reducing the whole human population into individuals. The West said there is nothing called a society. This is called methodological individualism. This is the first step towards modern anthropology. And Margaret Thatcher was asked, no, whatever you are doing is affecting the society. She said, there is nothing called a society. They destroyed the society. Ultimately ended up destroying the family. Families cannot survive without societies. It is societies that protect the families. Families live together because of their place, their pride. They feel shy if something happens in their family and that comes out. So the society supervises the family into discipline. So they destroyed the society. With the result, their families are destroyed. Today, 47% of the babies born in England are born for unwed mothers. 41% of the babies born in, in America are born for unwed mothers. In the Scandinavian countries, which are supposed to be number one in human development index, the child born is nationalized. The mother doesn't own the child. It is owned by law under the constitution it is the inspector of mothers, the inspector of children, who will supervise whether the mother is behaving all right with the child. This is what modern has, law has led to. But can the world survive on this? Scandinavian countries, total population, all the four countries put together, is less than the city of Madras. Can that be an example for the world? And we still talk about Scandinavian countries are number one in human development. 67% of the men and women live together, anybody with any length of time without marriage, and that is supposed to be number one in human development index. They have no anthropological memory. They have no cultural habits left, which connected them to 500 years back. A country like America has no history lasting beyond 300 years, because if they look back, it is only the history of killing the uh, uh, Native Americans. So I will close this with what all of us consider to be the modern anthropological approach to economics which integrates law, society, politics and economics. He writes, a late classic of the genre was Walter Rostow's Stages of Economic Growth, 1957 Walter Rostow, one of the very important exponents of modern anthropology, he wrote about how modern societies come up and what is the aim of modernity, goal of modernity. He said with its unilear sequence of five developmental stages from traditional society to the age of mass consumption, if you convert the society into mass consumption society, that is the fulfillment of modernity. Simplicity, all the qualities of restrained living, savings, sharing with others, 
all this is to be destroyed an individual must be given an endless amount of desire to acquire and enjoy so five stages of growth from traditional societies to the age of mass consumption rosto must be among the first to conceive that the culmination of human social evolution was shopping if you make the entire society shop then you have achieved the end of modernity explicitly argued as an alternative to the marxian stages of progress rosto's thesis appear as a mirror image with the added advantage of turning left into right twice over common to many theories of development was a cheerful sense of cultural tragedy the necessary disintegration of the traditional societies that function in rosto scheme as a precondition for economic takeoff you can never have economic takeoff unless you destroy the tradition this is the principle of economic development this is the developmental anthropology this is the modern anthropology which destroys the very meaning of anthropology as malinowski said but we are the affected people and we are losing a whole lot of civilizational assets cultural assets we are losing our social capital but we are not studying this so foreign domination was needed to accomplish this salutary destruction you can't destroy it yourself so foreigners must come and you must invite foreigners come and destroy this since otherwise the customary relationship of traditional production would set a ceiling on economic growth by its own providential history europe had been able to develop itself but according to rosto the other people have to be shocked out of their backwardness by an intrusive alien force it can be globalization it can be colonization it can be anything but one has to be shocked out of his existence see how beautifully he puts it there no revolutionary himself rosto could agree with marx that in order to make an omelet one must first crack the eggs do we understand how important it is to study anthropology in every sense of the term ayurveda is an anthropology siddha is anthropology yunani system is anthropology your dance music is anthropology legal anthropology is the fundamental basis because it provides the government with the power to destroy your tradition so we need to study legal anthropology we need to popularize this knowledge the legal community must be made to intellectually understand this concept that's why i feel the lawyers who are who have become just an intelligent profession that also is becoming less and less now they should be an intellectual profession and that is my request i am extremely happy that shastra has taken up this responsibility and i will do my best because this has been my area of study for the last 30 years so i would like you students you know everything is available on the internet today you need not have to go and search for any author you need not have to search for any source material everything is available on the all of you must go and study how important it is you will realize your own self image the mirror of yourself the mirror of your family the mirror of your society the mirror of how we relate to each other you will find once you go back to the study of legal anthropology in the sense in which the indians have handled themselves and that will find many many answers for the conflict that we are not able to handle through the modern uh, legal system and i think shastra is going to in the next 4 5 years do such a pioneering work and if it can produce a master research work on anthropology that will be the greatest ever contribution to india which is no more a nation which is dismissed it is no more a defeated race it's rising as a global power on the 12th of december 2012 the national intelligence council of america came out with a report you know national intelligence council of america is the think tank of the cia which you know how powerful that body is they came out with a report as to what the world will be in 2030 in 2030 the national intelligence council said there will be only three major world powers 
America, China and India. All the powers today will become regional in character because India's military rise, the amount of army India is possessing, the amount of production, productive capacity India is building, the intellectual and educational resources India is building is going to make India on par with these three countries. And you know, in such a country, nobody can say you have to follow our ways. Maybe we have to tell them you will have to follow our ways. Your families are losing value. Look at our women. They have studied English. They have studied your law. They have studied everything, but they are still kept in the tradition. They have maintained the families. Our divorce rate is the lowest in the world. We still take care of our parents, not thrown them to the character of the state, to the, to the care of the state. We still take care of our unemployed people. We have not thrown them to the care of the state. This has not happened by government or law. This has happened because of the cultural underpinning to our society, economics, family, relationship between people, because we are a relation-based society. This message India has to give to the world, in which legal anthropology will play a very important role. I am extremely thankful that Shastra has undertaken this responsibility and given me the... given me the opportunity to be their mentor. I am not, I will not be a mentor. I will be only a troubleshooter. And you people will have to do the job. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, sir, for reminding us the truth about ourselves and not uh, to listen to the lies that other people have been telling about our culture for so many years. Um, now, if uh, the Dean would felicitate our uh, Honorable Judge after he has mentioned a few words. Yeah. Uh, judge, sir, could you? Good afternoon to all of you. It is a surprise for me that I have been called to say a few words before this august audience. I tell you that before I come over here, when my friend Mr. Kupsami, the public prosecutor of Punjab district, wanted me to convey the message to this, to this astra. I requested him not to convey because I wanted to be with you in the audience. It is uh, this morning only I came to know about this program. I think it was in the month of March of this year. Mr. Guru Murthy addressed you. I had the fortune of receiving a CD containing a speech. Very recently, mostly I believe it was last week, I heard it in full. I really thought in this way. Had I been called by Sastra to address you on this topic, I confess, I believed that I would not attest any of the subjects which Mr. Guru Muthi tested here before you in his address. Such a great personality he is. <laughs> that is why today I have the opportunity of reading many of his articles. I am a regular reader of many of his articles. That is the reason why I made it a point to be here today to hear you, sir. Really, it's a great opportunity for me to hear you on a new subject. I tell you, when we interpret the law in courts, mostly, as you said, we not only go by the literal interpretation, we also interpret the law by the way in which the society look at it. Look at it. 
So we are not deviating from the expectations of the society and we also do go by the expectations of the society. While doing so, we also have a concern for our tradition, our culture and all that. I tell you very recently, I had an occasion to deal with a labor case. Where the question was, whether uh, the, what is that, uh, automobiles manufacturing industry. This is the language used in the, in the, in the Motor Vehicles Act. Whether this will include an industry which is producing manufacturing components of motor vehicles. This was the question. I wrote in my judgment like this. See, the interpretation should be the way in which it is understood by a man who is targeted by the law. Here, this is a legislation for the benefit of the working class who are mostly illiterates or semi-literates. If you ask a person whether a manufacturing industry which manufactures battery, which is an important component in the manufacturing of automobiles he is an automobile industry then certainly he will say no in his perception an automobile industry means the industry like uh, this Hyundai uh, by India Limited like that so finished goods that is his understanding so giving this as an example I said that this uh, industry which produces or manufactures the components of automobiles are not automobile industries. This is the way in which we interpret it. Therefore, sir, I, I assure you that we are very much conscious of our anthropology, our heritage, our culture, everything when we are interpreting the law. I am very thankful to you for having reminded me again that we should be conscious of the society where from we have come, where we are living now. We have not come from Western, Western uh, countries. We are living here. We have come from this society. Therefore, we are taking all these things into account. I think that uh, yet another case which I dealt with, I can tell you, that case was subject to wide uh, coverage in uh, media and the press. A young girl, a poor villager, was uh, staying with her father and brother. She was studying, sir, may I take one, one more minute, sir? <laughs> sir? Only one minute, I will finish. I will tell you only about this case which I dealt with. Many of you might have seen this in the Hindu and other papers. A young girl, yeah, there about 18, she was going to a college in Chennai. Her father was a spendthrift drunker. Brother was locally employed in a company and he was earning a small amount and he was maintaining the family. And he had brought his sister all the way from Nagar Koyil, making her to stay with him to study in a local college. This father, in a drunken state, on few occasions, unmindful of the relationship which used to be cherished for a father and daughter relationship, this fellow misbehaved with her. She told her brother also about this. His brother on one or two occasions heard and requested his sister not to say about this to others because this will spoil the family's image, tradition and all that. On the crucial day, what happened by about 8 o'clock, this girl finished all her domestic works, then she went to bed. The father came, brother was not at home, he came, the father came. He was fully drunk, he was sleeping in the hall, she was sleeping in the room. By about one o'clock, she felt that somebody was touching her. Then she found her father sitting by, his, by her side and she was advancing to have sex with her. Immediately, she, she, she struggled a lot. 
she could not. This man had a knife. She snatched the knife, stabbed him. He died on the spot. Then she passed on, passed on the message to her brother and others. All came. Complaint was registered. Case was registered. In this country, it is unfortunate that the girl was prosecuted for murder. This matter was brought to the High Court by one social activist under 482 CRPC. I was sitting there, came up before me. Normally, what the High Court will know, will do, you know very well. High Court will not at that stage interfere under 482 more particularly. What we will say? No, this is a matter for evidence. You go before the trial court, face the trial, come out. I said nothing doing. Law has to evolve. Law is not so blind to make a girl to undergo this ordeal of trial. Nothing doing. I called the girl. I, I wanted the girl to be present before the court. The girl was present. Her brother was present. The girl wept, wept and wept. Then it shut my conscience. See, in that case, I quoted Mahatma Gandhi. This was all the criticized, sir, by some of our people. How a judge can quote Mahatma Gandhi, Turkural, Quran, Bible, and all that in the judgment? How this can be done? I didn't mind. I quashed the charge sheet for the first time, accept the plea of self-defense. I quashed. In the press, there is some writing about it. Somebody said, it is a historic judgment where the court has taken the cause of the human values, more particularly the cause of the women. Sir, this is really the anthropology which we have taken into account. One example I am saying. I can quote many cases. Sir, people say that judiciary should be accountable. Now there is much talk about accountability. Sir, I tell you I am accountable to whom? To whom? I am accountable to my conscience first. I am accountable to my conscience. Then I am accountable to the society. This is what basically I believe in my life. This should be the anthropology of law. This is our tradition. We have been living up to our conscience, touching our conscience throughout. That is why I tell you that please be accountable to your conscience. Don't forget about the, our, our tradition, heritage and all that. What is happening in this country, please kindly see. For the past one week you have been seeing, watching TV. What is happening? A college going girl. Where the tradition has gone. Yesterday when I was traveling in the train, one person from uh, the city industry was traveling. He was talking about this case. Without knowing I was, uh, I was a judge and all that, and he was traveling with me, he was talking about this case. I told him that, sir, who is responsible for this? Is it not the cinema? Who, who taught the younger generation who are at the tender age that they can marry without informing their parents? They can live apart. At the time when the parents try to fix up the marriage, you can discuss. See, we have married two years before and we have been living as husband. Who taught this? Where are we heading towards? What is the machinery mechanism we have to control? What is the mechanism we have to control these things which destroy our tradition? In this context, I really am very grateful to Sastra and I am also really very grateful to Sir, Mr. Guru Murthy, to remind you who you people are, what is our tradition, what are the high values which you have inherited from our forefathers, which we have to give to our successes. Please kindly remind this. Keep in your mind. I am thankful, sir, suddenly you have called me. It is a, though it is a very great uh, surprise for me, I tell you, 
just like every one of you, I have heard a lot, I have learnt a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> you know, some such speeches without any written script, uh, usually people share things that are very close to their heart. Uh, so you have really spoken your heart out uh, today without any advance notice to you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we are running short of time, though we had some provision for Q&A, but nevertheless, I don't want to disappoint the student audience. We'll take uh, two quick questions, sir. Two quick questions, okay? Don't set a question paper. Two quick questions, yeah. Okay, we are gender neutral also, so we will take three as well. Let's, let's start. Um, Pranam, sir, my name is Satish Prem. I'm a final year student here. My question is to Gurumurthy, sir. Uh, sir, in your speech, you uh, gave certain amount of anthropological sanctity to informal institutions of dispute uh, resolution. Sir, don't you think recognition of such institution like the panchayats will undermine the rule of law in the country? Rule of law is modern rule of law. How much this rule of law can deliver is something over which I have developed doubts for the last 30 years. That is why I am involved heavily in mediation. In fact, many biggest disputes which the courts would never be able to resolve for 20 years, 25 years, get resolved by human intervention in a matter of sometimes one or two weeks. That human intervention is available in India. So you can probably devise norms as to how the panchayat should function. Destroying them is not the alternative. In fact, regulating them not through law, regulating them through a certain self-disciplinary measures. And if they move out of that, then you can certainly uh, do whatever you need to do. But there is a need to align this because most of the disputes in the villages are very small disputes. And if those disputes come to court, not only the villagers, money and all that, there is permanent enmity between people. They live, 500 people live in a village and somebody should be there to resolve their disputes. Otherwise, two sets of families they are sworn enemies for the next two generations. See the social disturbance. So we cannot look at it from an urbanizable, urbanizing mind. We have to look at it from how villages function. You know, by 2061, India will have 50% rural population. By 2061. So please understand. Yeah, second question. And then the third question there. Uh, just two quick questions. One to SG, sir, uh, on uh, uh, the study of Roman law has been touted, you know, in legal anthropology for long, what the codes were written, and we are still studying it in law school over many years, your views on that. And one to the Solicitor General on uh, the case was regarding Agamas, which was A.S. Narayana Dikshitulu's case. There was so much from, you know, the Assyrian court to the Unmatta Panchar, which your very learned father cited, and all of us have benefited from that. But what has happened to that league of arguing? We have totally lost out on those cases. We don't see such cases anymore. Your views on that. Thank you. The ghost of A.S. Narayana Dikshitulu, I think, is, has again risen now. And uh, the matter is under review. Now I think it's before a three-judge bench of Justice Singhvi. And uh, possibly they are reconsidering the characters. You will hear very shortly some good news. See, anthropology by nature is society specific. Simply because more books are published in Roman anthropology, uh, a lo Roman law of anthropology, it will not be applicable to India. It is not applicable to even Rome because that Rome is not there. It is only of archival value even for Greco-Roman civilizations because if there are any two civilizations which have been completely exterminated, it is these two civilizations. Yeah, last question. Uh, yes, my question is to Gurmuthi, sir. Uh, good, good afternoon, sir. 
you were talking about uh, panchayats as a system of uh, dispute resolution. My question is, if people choose to go to courts instead of uh, resorting to traditional methods like panchayat, don't you think there are probably inherent defects in our system also, something like probably caste bias, which deters them from going there? How are we going to address that? How are we going to solve them so that we can take up those measures in our hand? Have we first made an appraisal of our system? Has there been any study done? There was one study done by the Gandhi Gram University. They visited 140 or 150 villages where in the last several years all disputes have been resolved within. And no one complained about those dispute resolution. Have we ever studied it? There is one place called Palamedu which is 26 kilometers or 30 kilometers from Madurai where in the last 50 years they have never gone to police station, they have never gone to court, all disputes are resolved within and they even have an informal legislation for themselves. There, there, are, there is a cinema theater in which what cinema should run, it is decided by the village panchayat. Have we studied these things? Or do we look at village panchayas through a, a mustache wielding man in film and he is uh, doing wrong things to ladies and so all panchayats are like that. See there has been no proper systematic fair assessment about the Indian traditional legal system. So without doing that there is no use saying panchayats are defective. How defective are they? How much they are they defective? How much are they failing? This is a matter. In fact, you better allow appeals from Panchayat, most disputes can be resolved. Thank you, sir. One last question from the faculty. Okay, quick. Sir, one last question from the faculty. Can I'm just quoting Tirukural. Irandum Yuruvaradal Vendendrin Parandu Gadaga Ullagi Yedriyan. So, Namurli, Pichakar, Koroning, like traffic signal, the Pakambo, customer. So, what is your comment on that? See, it is only the beggar's children which requires government assistance. There, every child is by law legislated to live only under government care. That's the difference. Those who cannot afford, the state has to take care of them. But there, the state has to take care of everybody because nobody takes care of anybody else. This is the difference. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for questions. Uh, I will now invite our head of the department, Dr. Ravishekar Raju, to give the vote of thanks. Honorable Justice Nagamuttu, Judge High Court of Madras, Honorable Chief Guest Sri Mohan Parasaran, our Special Guest and Research Chair Mentor Sri Gurumurthy, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Respected Registrar, Respected Dean Planning and Developments, Deans from other schools, faculty members and my dear students. It is my privilege to propose the vote of thanks today. It is a red letter day in the young life of School of Law. The School of Law started in the year 2008 with just a small strength of eight students. And now we are having 412 students in the department. In fact, we have achieved this tremendous growth with the blessings of our Honorable Vice Chancellor, who has taken a dynamic decision in starting the School of Law in Sastra campus, though there was opposition from various corners. First of all, I should uh, convey my heartfelt thanks to our Honorable Vice Chancellor for starting the School of Law in this campus. And the School of Law is the brainchild of our Honorable Vice Chancellor. Then with the inauguration of research chair in the legal anthropology today, School of Law has taken the next giant step in its journey towards being a premier center for legal education and research. The function today is enriched by the august and inspiring presence of eminent jurist and solicitor general of India, Sri Mohan Parasaran, 
It has added prestige and value to this inauguration and underlines the significance of this center to legal research. It is an honor to have you here on this occasion, sir. <laughs> on behalf of Shastra University, I express my heartfelt gratitude to you, sir. Thank you. Further, we thank you for your thought-provoking lecture on being a successful jurist. In fact, our student got inspired by your lecture. Sri S. Gurumurthy, our special guest today, has been a pillar of strength in all our endeavors. I would like to recall the landmark lecture he has made during the inauguration of Tarka Shastra, the Shastra's annual moot court competition, which has attracted more than 40 schools from throughout the India, and wherein the participants from right from Delhi to uh, Kerala, we have invited 40 law schools for participating in the Tarka Shastra National Moot Court Competition. It is also during the occasion when Sri Gurumurthy mentioned the importance of legal research in le research in legal anthropology and the potential contribution it can make to legal research in India. It is only fitting that he will be the research chair mentor. I place on record our immense gratitude for the encouragement and guidance and look forward to your enlightened contribution in furthering the agenda for this center. Thank you once again, sir. <laughs> Further, we thank you for your inspiring lecture on need to study legal anthropology. Our special vote of thanks are due to Mr. Beharan Palkiwala, the brother of late Nani Palkiwala, Sri S. Saran Patanjali, grandson of late Patanjali Shastri, Sri G. Rajgopal, brother of late G. Ramaswamy, for allowing us to name the scholarship schemes in the memory of the individual's concern. We also thank Sri Arvind Dattar, the senior advocate, for helping us in reaching out to the family of late Nani Palkiwala. I also thank Honorable Justice Nagamutu, the judge of High Court of Madras, for associating with us in this function. I also take this opportunity to thank all the members of uh, Sastra family for their support and encouragement, and I thank the media for their coverage of this program. Thank you, one and all. Ladies and gentlemen, kindly rise for the national anthem. Sanaganamanadhinayak jayahe Bharat bhagya vidata Punjab Sindhu Gujarat Maratha Dravida Bhutkala Banga Vindya Himachala Yamuna Ganga Uchala Jaladhita Ranga Dava Shubha Name Jahe Dava Shubha Ashisha Mahe Gahe Tava Jaya Gata Janagana Mangala Dayak Jaya He Bharata Bhagya Vidata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya 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 He Kindly remain seated while the uh, guests of honor make leave from the audience, uh, from the uh, from the amphitheater. Thank you. <laughs> 